Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Athenaeum. I'm Hiram Chodash. I'm president of the college. It's great to have everybody here. I was just remarking to Zach that this is year five, year five of the Dreyer Roundtable. And I want to thank, uh, before uh, turning the mic over to David Dreyer, the one and only honorable eminence uh, to uh, introduce the program, but also to just extend a word of thanks to Zach Corser, Eric Helland, and Ken Miller uh, for joining in this effort. Um, the basic idea of the roundtable was to get an engaged viewpoint diversity on the critical issues of our day, and we chose roundtable not a V in a, as the verses in a lawsuit or the aisle in Congress, but as a way of suggesting that there can be multiple perspectives on any one issue and getting people around the table like we do here at the AF to break bread and to understand each other's positions and to come to some underlying deeper common understanding. We have run many conferences uh, that have attempted to understand and transcend those divides to reverse polarization on major controversies We've created fellowships for research and internships for our students. Uh, we created uh, the first public policy lab course uh, here. And if we think about where we've come and then map that onto what's going on around us, I would say that we have even more pressing commitments to pursue today. I mean, I was looking at some of the early titles of dry around table topics, divide, polarization, Today we're talking about madness, right? Think about that. And so for us, it's not to just sit back and to uh, observe negatively or critically about the way the world is headed. It's actually to reinforce our own educational commitments to meet those challenges. So we've taken the public policy lab as course and we put it on a larger platform as a way for our students and faculty to join together to create public policy solutions. We've supported it through a whole public policy sequence, the equivalent of, our, uh, of a, what might be a minor in another academic institution. We are joining with the new quantitative and computing lab to create a greater sophistication about data in a world of uh, what has been called truth decay the importance of empiricism to bring actual facts to these controversies so that we are working off the same empirical page. And the college is reinforcing its commitments to freedom of expression, viewpoint diversity, and engaged dialogue through a new initiative we call the Open Academy Initiative, which isn't just about policy or invited speakers, but about how we discharge our educational commitments to build the social and intellectual capacities in this generation to be able to not just speak freely, not even just debate better, but actually reach solutions in our most, most controversial settings. And with that, I just want to say to everyone here, thanks to uh, David and my colleagues for having founded and started this amazing roundtable. Thanks to Mike Murphy and Robert Shrum for coming and joining us today to see if we can reach some deeper level of understanding, but also to give us some sense of what we can do uh, to solve these problems and bring the country together. So David, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming today, and it's an honor to be with you. <clears throat> President Chodosh obviously is not uh, a politician. He's way too modest. Uh, he conceived of the round table concept. Wolfgang Puck bought the two of us lunch one day, and he uh, set forth this entire idea. We had an original discussion with Pam Gann about it, but this was really the first initiative that Hiram Chodosh launched as he began his presidency just over five years ago. And I, too, want to join in expressing appreciation to Ken Miller, and Eric Helland and Zachary Corser for all that they have done to make it a success. Hiram touched on some of the, the great successes. I should say that we, next month, are gonna be doing a program here on our first, first book, Parchment Barriers, which is 
based on uh, Madison's 48th Federalist line about words actually not being able to hold people uh, to the fire, feet to the fire, and it's on the whole issue of polarization. We had a great program at James Madison's home, Montpelier, and uh, that book is going to be coming out, uh, as I say, in the coming weeks. And we have our second book on the horizon on populism that is going to be uh, coming out soon. And I'm very happy to say that we've been able, with the support of a wide range of people in this room and others, to provide over $100,000 in scholarships. And uh, that's... Uh, And I, and I want to say uh, that uh, we're very, very fortunate to all the students here. We're very fortunate to be uh, joined by a group of my colleagues as trustees. And I want to say that um, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of the hanger on, David. It's great being in these committee meetings where there are three Davids, uh, David McGruley and David Hudson, and the hanger on, David Dreyer, who is there. And uh, I want to say that these trustees are extraordinarily dedicated. I had a conversation with David Hetz uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he described CMC as his second family. And so what I would like to do is I would like to ask all of the trustees who are here to stand up and be recognized, and for all the students to give a round of applause to all of the CMC trustees who are here. So you all can no longer say that the job of trustee is a thankless job. You've just been thanked for uh, all of your great service. Um, forty years ago, exactly forty years ago, I was living in Phillips Hall and with the founding president of this institution who was retired, George C.S. Benson, he served as the chairman of my campaign when I first ran for the Congress. I think Bruce Saul probably was helping me out then. and, and um, and Jeff Klein was doing everything he could to make sure I was defeated. But anyway, so, um, so I, I uh, lived in the dormitory when I won the, the, the nomination. And uh, I went on to lose that election in 1978, four weeks from today, very narrowly. And two years later, I was, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. Two years later, I was able to be elected, and I was able to go into the... Congress, when, when Ronald Reagan went in, we were able to make what I think are some very positive changes, uh, some of which we're still feeling today. Now, I, I, the idea behind the round table is really not that secret, and I do like to, to put it out here. I want more CMC students to consider part of their lives in public service. Right now, it's not a terribly appealing um, career for people. And it ended up, uh, I didn't plan it to be a career for me. I spent a third of a century there. Uh, but I'm very grateful that I did it. I'm happy it's in the rearview mirror, I have to say. But I do think that it's important for us to find smart, well-educated, honest, hardworking, capable people to step forward. And Bruce is nodding, and I know that he spends a lot of his time thinking about this. And I'm the first CMC uh, graduate to serve in the Congress and the only CMC student to graduate in the Congress and I don't like that. I want a Democrat or a Republican who's graduated from this institution to serve in the United States Congress and in other spots. I know we have lots of people who've gotten into public service but that is really the not so secret mission of the Dreyer Roundtable. This place is very special. Um, I, I did not vote for Donald Trump in the last election. I happened to write in a good friend of mine called John Huntsman for President of the United States and Carla Hills, uh, who was the negotiator of the North American Free Trade Agreement, as vice president. And they both loved the fact that I did that. But one of the reasons I wrote in John Huntsman's name is that John Huntsman, having run for president in 2012, called me on the phone after he had campaigned, he's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, and he'd been on every Ivy League campus. He went college campus after college campus. And Huntsman said to me, <clears throat> you know, i got to tell you, David, as I visited all of these campuses, there was no campus that I visited with students who were as bright, capable, asked better questions than those at Claremont McKenna College. And to me, that was a great indication of the potential that exists here 
among our undergraduates. And so that Huntsman message is one that you all need to live up to, and uh, I have little doubt at all that you will. As I uh, saw my, uh, my friend and, and former colleague John McCain buried a few weeks ago, and as I've observed the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings over the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, two weeks, I guess, um, one of the things that struck me, and it saddens me that I have to say this, but it struck me that is necessary and that we are exploring, and I've talked to, to David Hetz and, and to Hiram uh, about this, and I've just reached out to the Annenberg Foundation. I am going to explore the notion of the round table actually providing a civility award to elected officials. And, Thank you. and it's really sad and pathetic that we have to do that because when I got in, civil discourse was sort of the, the guide that we, we all had for me and, and I was proud to do that. I mean, to disagree without being disagreeable, to follow James Madison's directive of a clash of ideas, but at the end of the day, accomplishing things and doing things. And uh, so I, I thought after those, the, the McCain services and, and, and these hearings that we need to do this. And so what I'm gonna propose is that, that the round table put together an award and uh, we haven't got it set, but to a Democrat and Republican who've engaged in civil discourse to recognize them. And um, I'd like to have a committee that would include some students and some outsiders and some faculty members here who would do it. So it's just really, it's an idea that just grew for me out of uh, what's happened in the last few weeks. And I would love any input that you could share with professors Miller, Helland, or Courser, uh, or to President Chodosh, or, or anyone else on, on uh, ideas of how we would handle this. Because I think that it's something that is unfortunately necessary for us to do today. So that's gonna be a new initiative that we are working on. So uh, you didn't come here to hear from me. Um, I, I, when Hiram said we've gone from discussions of immigrate, we've had you know programs here with uh, cabinet members from Democratic and Republican presidents, foreign leaders here and all, and Hiram said we were going from populism and polarization now to madness. And so I, I spent time thinking of the two stark raving mad people I've known in my life, and I came up with the names of Bob Shrum and Mike Murphy. And uh, they both fall in that category, and I've known them for a long period of time. I was just telling Shrummy that I uh, first remember being introduced to him by uh, uh, an old columnist who I can't believe, Shrummy just told me he passed away nine years ago, Bob Novak, who introduced me to, to Bob Shrum Novak was such a, a, a great help to me. He, I had asked him for advice, and he'd always say, I'm not, I don't give advice, I'm a reporter. He was a very crusty guy. And, uh, but then he proceeded to give me great advice. He told me to get on the Rules Committee, and he advised me constantly. He would call and give me all kinds of advice. But one of the greatest things that he did was introduce me to, to Bob Shrum. And I don't think you ever ran any campaigns against me at all, did you, Bob? I mean, you never, never opposed me. But Bob has... has uh, ran John Kerry's effort, he's, he's an amazing writer and uh, just a, a wonderful talent and, and a great friend. And Mike Murphy and I had slightly known each other in Washington, D.C., but uh, we became partners in crime when I was uh, out on the beach in Malibu and the telephone rang and this guy said he was on the set of The Tonight Show and it was Arnold Schwarzenegger sitting with Jay Leno and he says, did I, I need you to help. So I went up to Schwarzenegger's house and for the next, whatever it was, 49 days or something like that, it was a living hell, but it was a, a roller coaster ride in this recall election that went on here. And we brought Mike Murphy in. Shrum's now came, taking credit for the fact that you came in into the thing Murphy just did to me. So uh, I uh, will say that he and I became great friends. I was commenting that Sharon and Don Rosen helped me in my first campaign and Mike Murphy in my last campaigns, uh, and I still survived it. And uh, they have a wonderful, wonderful entity that they've put together and uh, it's being promoted brilliantly with a video that I participate in and they uh, are uh, working together to, to focus on this notion of again being able to disagree without being disagreeable and uh, they are going to tell us what's going to happen in the next few weeks and they're going to tell us about their project and I'm going to sit down and shut up and turn it over to our research director the great Zachary Corser.
Well, thanks very much, David, for that introduction. And uh, got a lot to talk about here. Um, I thought I'd give start off. Um, we've already done a, a little bit of a, a bio here for for both of our, our guests, and it's an honor to have them both here talking today. I just want to give you a little bit of perspective on their backgrounds. Um, start with Mike. Uh, he's one of the Republican Party's most successful political consultants. If you've heard of a presidential candidate that's a Republican, Mike has probably had something to do with it. He's worked for Jeb Bush, Mitt Romney, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Christine Todd Whitman, John Engler, Tommy Thompson, the list goes on. You've seen him, I know you've seen him on, I can't forget John McCain, of course. Um, you've had to have seen him on television, of course. He's, he's uh, been on NBC, CNN, NPR. Um, he's, he's a fixture in Republican politics. He's an asset to the Republican Party. He knows so much about campaigns and elections, and we're really honored to have him here. And to have his equal from the other side of the aisle, Robert Shrum. Uh, he teaches at uh, USC and serves as the director of the Jesse Unruh Institute for Politics. He has a storied career in politics as well, television commentator, campaign advisor to Democratic candidates in nearly 40 winning U.S. and gubernatorial candidate, uh, campaigns. And for the mayoralty of many American major cities, he's had clients including uh, Ted Kennedy, Joe Biden, John Glenn, Barbara Mikulski, uh, uh, and also uh, John Kerry and Al Gore. So you can see that we're very fortunate to have these two perspectives on the midterm election. Now these guys aren't just talking about the midterm election though too, they've just started a new center at USC. It's entitled the Center for the Political Future, which to me is a very optimistic title. <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll start with you, Bob, or, or Mike, uh, can you tell us a little bit about this new institute and what you hope to achieve? Uh, sure, I'll be quick and you're, you're do the stuff I forget. I just first want to thank you for having me here. And Bob, we're very excited about this. Uh, this is my second time. Uh, my dear old friend of two decades, David Dreyer, had lured me here before. You know, a guy saves your life in one train wreck, you're doing free speeches for the next 40 years. <laughs> but uh, it is great to see my old friend David Dreyer again. Uh, he was a truly great American. We could use a lot more like him in the party right now because we're in a crisis. I will just say about this center, yeah, absolutely, he deserves it. <laughs> you know, I'll just say, without turning this into a dry -thon, when you're a political advisor, and Bob's had this experience too, you're backstage when they have to make the hard decisions, when the pressure is on them, the voter pressure, the interest group pressure to go the other way, and a lot of them are weather vanes, was not true with dry around the toughest stuff and that political courage is rare. So, uh, about this institute, yeah, Bob recruited me into this. Um, the Center for Political Future is about some of the same things that our fine university president spoke about, which is how do we turn, re-incentivize the political world to believe in the same set of facts again, and while differences are great, how do we have a fair fight that in the end doesn't result in burning down the stadium? You know, how do we get to some sort of problem solving here? <laughs> Uh, how, do we, how do we have a rule book for this kind of engagement? So we have a whole bunch of aspects of this involving the academy, uh, in, in, involving the kids we're trying to educate at USC to hopefully, like here, go into public service, and we think we can have a national impact, too. We want to break the equation of, I'm right, you're evil. So anything I do to you is legitimate, and anything you do is illegitimate, which has sadly taken over American politics and will, in the end, have such a corrosive effect, we no longer have functional politics, which is a direct threat to our democracy. So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, I just add simply, we want to <coughs> model and advance dialogue that respects each other and where we respect the truth. Uh, because Mike's right. Excuse me. <coughs> Daniel Patrick Moynihan once said, everybody's entitled to their own opinions. No one's entitled to their own facts. What? I don't think his microphone's working. Can you hear me in the back? <laughs> I can talk louder. <laughs> Brian will come up and help us with that. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so I was quoting Moynihan's line about you're entitled to your own opinions but not your own facts. The problem today is that people can get their own facts. They can go to any outlet that reinforces what they already believe. So we want to get back to a fact-based dialogue where, you know, Mike and I don't agree on much of anything, but we <laughs> kind of agree on what the truth is. So <laughs> when you know what the truth is, you can argue how you should deal with it from different perspectives or different sets of values. We're going to do this with conferences, with programs, with uh, an initiative on the disruptive effect of technology on our politics, uh, with s some papers that are not going to be, they're going to be accessible. They're going to be done by academics, but they're going to be accessible. So for example, we have a, 
a professor in the political science department who has done some very interesting research that indicates that the gender gap is actually largely driven by race. And we'll put out like a five-page paper on that. It'll, it, it will not be heavily academic. It will be accessible. We want to take the academy into the public square. Enough about us. <laughs> Go to your... <laughs> okay. First question uh, is to you, Bob. So if you work in the academy and you, and you work around American politics, one of the things that you're always asked to do is get out there and do that midterm or presidential talk, right? So you have to put out the conventional wisdom and then talk a little bit about this, the race that's going on and then do your, your punditry. So we'll try to do a bit of that here today. So I think the best place to start is on that conventional wisdom. I mean, in order to understand what we're going to talk about in terms of the particulars of this election, typically how do uh, midterm elections go with a president's first term? Uh, with very few exceptions, uh, 1934, 1962, 2002, uh, with very few exceptions like that, uh, the party that holds the White House generally loses a substantial number of seats. Now, 34, you had Roosevelt pulling the country out of the Depression. 62, you had Kennedy having just gone through the Cuban Missile Crisis. Then 2002 came not long after 9-11. Well, 98 was the sixth year. Uh, and that, that's, that, that's a real amazing thing in, in the sixth year of a president's term. You always lose seats. 98 was the exception to that, I think because the country got tired of all the talk about impeaching Bill Clinton. Uh, so on the natural, this would be a hard year for Republicans. I think it's an even harder year than that because of the impact of President Trump. Uh, he is, talk about disruptive technologies, he's, he's a disruptive force unlike anything we've seen in our politics. I think you're going to see suburban Republican women and suburban independent women moving away from the Republican Party. Uh, Democrats, I think, will take the House. Uh, the, the Kavanaugh situation may actually help Republicans in some of these red state Senate races. But those red state Senate races are not an indication of what's going to happen across the board in the House. Uh, so I make that prediction mindful of the fact that Mr. Murphy and I were on the circus on Showtime the Sunday before the 2016 election. And I said, absolutely no way, never, <laughs> not in this life, not in this universe, not in an alternative universe, could Donald Trump ever be elected president of the United States. So that's my prediction for whatever it's worth. <laughs> no, no, he agreed. I said the same thing, which is why we finish at 1 o'clock sharp. Bob and I are both due at our real job done in the hotel kitchen here. Um, I, I fundamentally agree with the analysis. So the historical pattern theory is the off year of the fresh first year of a new president is often bad. Now, I'm always a skeptic about the theory that if Napoleon had nuclear <laughs> subs, we'd all be speaking French, you know, where you kind of <laughs> historical determinism. But it, it has held true. You tend to look at the inputs into it, and the inputs are generally two that really count. One, how popular is the president, and how's the economy doing? Well, the president is unpopular. Every poll has his unfavorable rating at least 10 points higher than his favorable rating, with most polls showing majority unfavorable. That's really, really bad, and that indicates a big <coughs> midterm loss, because it tends to be, whether you want it to or not, a referendum on the president. A referendum on this president will mean lost Republican seats. The other input is the economy, how people perceive. Perception and reality, big thing in politics, how people perceive the economy. And they perceive it pretty well. That said, the, the fact the labor market hasn't sped up to catch the red-hot economy, people perceive in real wages that they don't get as much for their labor as they think they used to or as they think they should. So the excitement about the economy, the economic numbers, are muted, which in politics means that people are not voting happy economy as much as you might think from the macro numbers. You see this on almost every poll you take in the state. What's the number one issue? It's almost always jobs in the economy. And in full, on a full employment, you wouldn't <laughs> normally expect that. So if President Trump were adroit, and could make this election totally a referendum on people do think the economy is doing better, the Republicans would have something to fight with. The problem is he, he, he isn't capable of any kind of normal message strategy. Instead, it's this narcissism of therapy by rally and tweet. 
Uh, you can tell I'm a never Trumper. Um, <laughs> I've been a never Trumper since I first d delved them in 1993 when I was working for the governor of New Jersey. Wanted us to build an exit ramp from the highway to his casino at taxpayer expense. <laughs> um, and then threatened to spend millions against us if we did. Uh, we responded with the most aggressive uh, a food beverage sales tax and kitchen inspection in the history of the gaming authority in Atlantic City. Uh, he's a bully. He will back down when you shut down his ice makers for three days. Uh, so to get to the point, I, I think Bob's analysis is the same as mine. Again, we differ on most things, but the facts are the facts. And the fact is we are likely, probably by three to one or better odds, to lose the House, lose House majority, even though with all the redistricting now, that takes a lot. The system is designed now for nobody to ever lose, but I think it is likely we do. In the Senate, this was going to be a big year of building a Republican <coughs> hedge against 2020, where there are problematic Senate races to defend, and we are not going to reach our full opportunity to pile up a couple of seats to weather the future storm. We could lose the Senate, but it is far less likely than the House. And the Kavanaugh thing has made our suburban House seats get worse, and the red states where Democratic senators like Heidi Heidenkamp or Claire McCaskill are defending has put them into a little bit more jeopardy because the tribes are lining up. We'll see if that's the same on election day, but that's where it is this week. So they, oftentimes we give names to particular kind of elections that have a particular kind of uh, character to them. You know, 1992 is the year of the woman. We had a lot of women being elected that year. I'm trying to think of a name to put on this election. I was thinking the polarization election, maybe the Trump election, and I have a little bit of a theory, and I just want to sort of play it out and see what you guys think. Are people this year, I mean, is the primary consideration, you talked about in years past about how the, eco you know, the economy obviously is a, a big consideration when people go into the voting booth. Pres people are reacting against the president during the first term, a little tired of him. Um, you look in the past, you compare this election to past elections, and it looks like, by, you know, but compared to past elections, which again is imperfect, this should be a jailbreak towards the Democratic Party. This should be a, a Democratic tsunami, not wave. Mm -hmm. And yet we're looking at about 30 seats, maybe. That seems to be the, the conventional wisdom right now about what Democrats are going to see. So I, I guess my question is, are people voting on issues, or are they voting for or against Trump? And I have a little bit of evidence I want to throw out there just to play with this a little bit. I, I was looking at Ron DeSantis's primary campaign in Florida. He did a lot of internal polling, and one of the interesting things he came up with uh, was that in looking at Florida GOP primary voters, he found that 52% supported Trump first, and only 37% actually supported the, the Republican Party. So what's this election about? Is it about Trump, or is it about other things? It's about two things. Uh, first, it's about Trump. Uh, in our uh, USC Dornsife LA Times poll that came out last week or the week before, uh, something like three quarters of people thought that Trump was the principal reason why they were going to vote one way or the other in the election. It was higher for Democrats, slightly lower for Republicans. So I think that's the first thing it's about. And the reason the economy, aside from what Mike was saying, the reason the economy is not a driving issue uh, is that he fills up all the space. He takes all the oxygen. Uh, I think Republicans in the Senate and the House have gone to the White House and said, please, 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 can he stop <coughs> tweeting? Can he stop yelling? Can he talk about the economy and nothing else? And of course, it doesn't happen. Uh, so he takes up all the oxygen. So it's the Trump midterm. It may also turn out to be a second year of the woman because there are so many women candidates. Uh, and I think the driving uh, decisive force in the election are going to be women voters, uh, and especially a lot of <coughs> suburban women who swallowed hard in 2016, weren't comfortable with Hillary Clinton, decided to, to vote for Trump, uh, and he did, he did carry white women, by the way, decided to vote for Trump, and are now pulling back and think there needs to be a check and balance. So it's both in terms of the number of candidates elected and in terms of who's going to influence the outcome. I think this could be the second year of the woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I would add, we're not sure it's not a Tusami yet. Polling's mm -hmm. not that precise, particularly as a predictor. Right now, the Republicans hold the governorship, which is always a good thing to watch if you want to know the politics of a state, because <coughs> it operates independently in some ways from the federal debate. We hold Illinois, <coughs> excuse me, we hold Michigan, we hold Wisconsin, we hold Ohio, we hold Florida, and it is quite possible we lose them all. 
We're behind, and we're going to lose Wisconsin, I believe. We're behind in Ohio, where we were ahead 30 days ago. We're significantly behind in Michigan. We are dead even or behind in Florida, depending on whose poll you believe. There's a competitive race in Georgia, by the way, um, and Illinois is gone. So we don't know how, we know there's a lot of water heading our way. I can't tell you which houses are going to get knocked down, but <laughs> something's going to happen. It is about Trump. It is always a referendum on the president. But Trump has a way of compounding that and making it a super referendum about him and driving particularly uh, intense feelings among the Democrats. Kavanaugh has brought some intensity to Republican feelings. That is fantastic if you want to win the North Dakota Senate race. Not so good in suburban Florida, Orange County, and other places that may determine the House and some of these key gubernatorial races. And as Bob says, Trump relishes in making it about him, even when it's not in his interest to. <clears throat> because Donald Trump is stuck on one speed. He's always playing Republican primary politics. He has backed into a demographic cul-de-sac of those voters, and he has created such intensity there, it's a, it's a, a loyalty test. <clears throat> there are no issues. You're with Trump or you're against him. And that has made him all powerful in that fairly small demographic planet. But the problem is a general election, even in the midterms, which tends to be an older, more Republican vote, has other voters in it. So there's another midterm election, 2010, that we could call the Tea Party election. I'm kind of curious, let's talk about the other side of the street and the Democratic Party and the experience they're having during their primaries and what we should expect in November and after. Are we seeing a Tea Party of the left emerging? And no. I, I, and I'm, and I'm going <laughs> to put a little evidence out there. Uh, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez, she defeated Joe Crowley, and it just sort of reminded me when it happened of Eric Cantor and his defeat, where you have somebody who's a leader in their party, this, in this case, Joe Crowley was uh, the head of the Democratic caucus, his caucus chair, I guess he still is till his, his term is over. Or actually, no, the special election, he's gone. Um, it's a possible reminder of there's something sort of percolating at the grassroots of the Democratic Party that maybe looks a lot like what was happening in 2010 with the Republican Party. And there's a lot of chatter going on right now, I think, from the right in particular, trying to say, oh, look out, we see this sort of rag radicalization on the left. So I guess I'll just put it to you both, and I, we've already got the beginnings of an answer there. Is there a, a, the start of the Tea Party on the left? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, in most of the races where someone has challenged a progressive Democrat by saying you're not progressive enough, mm -hmm. uh, the, the incumbent or the progressive Democrat has won. There hasn't been a huge wave of uh, the kinds of victories you saw in in, in New York or Massachusetts with Michael Capuano. And by the way, in both of those races, those districts changed radically from the time those guys were first elected. Uh, Joe Crowley's district in Queens is no longer Irish American. It's a 70% minority district. And I think he took the district for granted. Uh, I think he was not like the district. He didn't resemble the district. Uh, and someone challenged him who was very much like that district. Uh, the same thing happened in Massachusetts. Uh, there will be a fight inside the Democratic Party uh, between, I'll call it the Bernie Sanders wing, or you can, whatever you want to name it, the, the, the Bernie Sanders wing and, and the more moderate wing, and moderate by moderate I mean center left. Uh, but that fight will largely play out in the 2020 presidential primary. I don't think it's playing out right now because to go back to what Mike was saying, you know, Trump has really energized Democrats. He is the great unifier of the Democratic Party. Uh, and Democrats really want to win this midterm. So if we take the House, there may be some fights about leadership, something like that. But right now, I don't think that this is principally an ideological combat inside the Democratic Party. I'd add one last thing. The great engine of the Tea Party uh, midterm, as you call it, in 2010, was health care uh, and people's uh, not liking Obamacare. Now that Obamacare is in place and a lot of people have been insured and a lot of people are covered by Medicaid, uh, if you watch Democratic commercials around the country, they're not making the mistake Hillary Clinton made of just running ads about Trump. You don't have to run ads about Trump. He runs ad of, ads about himself on television all the time. Uh, those ads are very heavily focused on health care. Health care is an issue which is ironically now helping Democrats when it devastated them in 2010. Yeah, the Dems are running all these congressional races on pre-existing conditions. 
they're running on middle class entitlements and a perception of the Republicans are going to take that away and it's been very effective for them. I, I agree with Bob on the facts, I slightly disagree on the conclusion, which is how we'd like politics to work, which is there has not been a Tea Party analogy in the Democratic Party in the midterms. And I agree with Bob, the focus on Trump has tamped that down. But I do believe there is a Democratic Tea Party energy. There is a reason that Bernie Sanders went from nowhere. He's not even a Democrat officially. He was an independent. He can't even put how to work a hairbrush together. And he almost grabbed the Democratic nomination from the biggest uh, dynasty the party's had you know, for three decades, the Clintons. So I would not underestimate the grassroots progressive power in the Democratic Party. It's just picking its battlefield. And the battlefield will be in 2019 when the Dems control most likely, not certain, but highly likely the House. And the presidential year starts. People forget the 2020 presidential race is really about 2019 because the primary is to pick the nominee are in the first quarter, really, of 2020. So the second half of 19 is all about Democratic primary and potentially Republican primary politics. And the first six months are the invisible primary, which is now, with the internet and cable news and all the craziness we have now, quite visible. So that schism is there, ready to erupt, fueled by the internet and the communications <coughs> technology that can get a message a lot of places quickly for free. And that's why I think 2019 is going to be an amazingly interesting and turbulent year in American politics. So I think the kindling is dry and there's going to be a struggle. Um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it resolves itself. So we've been talking a lot about the House of Representatives and what's going to happen there. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the Senate. The, there's lots of seats to talk about, stuff that's too close to call. We've talked about how the Kavanaugh hearings may have energized the Republican base in certain red states and jeopardized some, some seats that could have gone to the Democrats. But for either of you, are there some bellwether seats that we should be looking at to sort of see what's going to happen in terms of who's going to take the Senate or what 2019 is going to look like? You know, is it Beto O'Rourke versus Cruz in, in, um, in Texas? Is it uh, Bill Nelson's struggle to hold on in Florida? Is there a seat that we should be looking at and paying attention to that's going to tell us something about this midterm? Well, if Beto O'Rourke wins in Texas, yeah. I think the Democrats will probably take the Senate. Uh, it's an uphill battle. Uh, he's basically tied in most of the polls. But, boy, it's just, it's just tough for a Democrat to win statewide in Texas. He's done an amazing thing, which is he's run a, a, a very unconventional campaign driven by social media where he puts himself on social media wherever he goes, and he's become a phenomenon. 55,000 people showed up to see him with Willie Nelson in Austin the other night, and then he went on without Willie Nelson to some other place in Texas, I forget, not a huge, large place, and he had 3,000 people show up. So it, I think he would be the canary in the coal mine. Uh, the races you have to watch, Nevada, Arizona, uh, Tennessee, although I think that's a tough race for Democrats. Uh, Bredesen is a very good candidate. Uh, uh, I think Heidi Heitkamp is in deep trouble in North Dakota and in in fact, she just announced uh, while we were having lunch that she was going to vote against Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation, which I think means she said to herself, look, I'm probably going to lose this thing anyway, so I'm going to vote the way I really want to vote. Uh, and uh, so I think, that, um, and then you have Missouri with Claire McCaskill and Indiana with Joe Donnelly. I think Donnelly will survive, Democrat in Indiana. Uh, McCaskill, I think, might, might differ with this. I think that's kind of a 50-50 proposition. Heitkamp. Uh, I, think, I think she probably loses. Uh, Arizona and Nevada, if what Mike was talking about earlier is true, that, it, that the water gets very blue and very high, <laughs> then I think Democrats might win both of those. Uh, and if, if, you know, there is a way for Democrats to get the Senate, but I think it's like a 25 or 30 percent chance. Yeah, I, I think, I'll start with Texas because the Beto thing is kind of interesting. You know, there's always a unrequited Democratic love affair with winning Texas. Remember the lady in the red tennis shoes a couple of years ago and all that national excitement and then it kind of fades away because Texas is Texas. But he's that, a lot better candidate than th she th turned out to be. That said, two factors are working his way. One is he's an internet sensation. That means money. He's actually outspending crews on television. And two, Texas has become demographically more purple. It's moving away from scarlet red. So I agree with Bob, if he wins, then, then I think probably Bredesen will win in Tennessee, and we've definitely lost the Senate. My guess is he narrowly loses. Now, 
The people who are working hardest to reelect them, interestingly enough, are Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, and uh, Cory Booker, because if Beto wins that race, he is the new front runner for the Democratic nomination. <laughs> so I think there, if you can put them down as undecided <laughs> on that particular uh, upset. The races I'm watching are Nevada, because demographically, so let me just back up. So here, here's a theory of the election that I think will be determinative if it is a good Democratic year or a great Democratic year. In a off year election, about 88, 89 million people vote. In a presidential year, it's up around 140 million, growing slightly with population. That's a big delta. That's almost 50 million people. Wh what is it? Well, presidential year voters traditionally don't vote in the off years at the same numbers. Who votes in both? Cranky old white people like me. There's a joke that when the Republican Party is on the march, you can see it's coming, slow but sure, <laughs> one step at a time. Democrats really want to screw with us, they just make use tennis balls illegal, and the whole thing would grind <laughs> to a halt. <laughs> but if the younger, more Latino, more people of color, um, more millennial, more casual vote that's reliable in presidential elections and leads Democrat, if a chunk of that shows up in the off year, that is the extra blue wave. Now the Democrats have spent trillions of dollars and technology and secret Google meetings and a lot of stuff to try to turn those voters out in the off year. Almost never happens. They just choose not to. But if Trump as a social value has ignited enough that they decide to vote this year, that's why the college Democrats are probably out trying to register all these students here. Um, they're for higher taxes on Apple iPads. Um, <laughs> you, you, you could have a big thumb on the scale of four, five, eight million new, fresh, off-year voters, and that could be enough for a Beto. That could be enough for a Phil Bredesen in Tennessee. That could really be the wipeout. So I'm watching Nevada, which I think if I had to bet, I'd bet on the Dem, but it's close, closer than I thought it would be, actually, uh, Dean Heller. And I'm watching Florida, which is always worth watching. Uh, where you have a big race for governor and a big race for uh, Senate. The Senate candidate, Bill Nelson, is a pretty weak candidate. The Republican governor who's running, Rick Scott, is an unlimited funding candidate. He was in front. Now it's even. And on the Senate, on the governor side, it's fascinating. You've got somebody who's, uh, my friends, and I've done a lot of work in Florida. I did all Jeb's campaigns down there. People have a lot of personal respect for him, the, the Mayor Tallahassee Gilliam. But, but he's Bernie, Bernie-esque. And on the other side, you've got a kind of cynical Republican who literally ran ads in the primary with it, teaching his toddler how to build a wall, bricks. And that was enough to win a Republican primary. It was cheap applause, though, because now he's got an anchor around his neck in the general election. Florida, another state that's leaning more and more blue. So those races are the ones I'm watching, both races in Florida and Nevada. And the outlier for me is Tennessee, although you could say the same for Texas. Yeah, and uh, if I could add, I, I should have mentioned Florida and Nelson, uh, by, and I should disclose that he was my client all the years that uh, I was in the business and he was running. Uh, that race, <coughs> I thought a month ago that Bill was in dire trouble. I think the polls continue to get better for him and weaker for Scott, and there's a reason for that. Scott had unlimited money, as Mike said. He went on television very early. Uh, Nelson, I think, smartly held his, his fire, and he went on television about two or three weeks ago. And you're already seeing the impact of that in the polls. So we've only got a few minutes left, so let's open it up for questions. And let's give preference to students. So if we could have some microphones circulate around. If you're a student, please raise your hand, ask a question to our political pros. We've got someone up here up front. This is our first day here, so bear with us. Oh, the microphones meet. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Diego. I'm a freshman. Um, I had a question about like social media, and you talked a little bit about the impact it had in Texas. So do you think social the increase in social media will have an impact on the turnout for the midterm elections in general? You know, it's a message amplifier. So if there's a message that will motivate those casual voters to show up, <laughs> social media will allow it to spread and have huge impact with limited spending behind it. So I think, I think it is going to happen, and I think it will be part, but I won't know till the day after the election. And if Beto O'Rourke wins, it will be huge. because of social media. Uh, a conventional campaign where he just ran television ads. What he's done 
is he's used, he's gone to every county in Texas. And he's, he's getting bigger and bigger and bigger crowds. And he's broadcasting on Twitter uh, and Facebook all, the, all his events. And then he's going on Twitter while he's being driven to another place, uh, or he's driving, and he's <laughs> talking. And then they post that. So what happened is, Texas, you would normally say you can't do retail politics. It's just too big. It's like California. He's turned retail politics into mass media politics by the way he's used social media. I've never seen anything like it. I had a congressional campaign years ago where people thought the member was out of touch because uh, it was a scholarly member who didn't really like hanging around with voters. And Not California. <laughs> and he, and uh, he was kind of out of touch, right? Right. So we, we went for a weekend. <laughs> Well, you know, out of touch. I mean, you can learn more in a poll than going door-to-door -door for four years, but um, it's just too big. But anyway, so we went door-to-door -door and we filmed it and put it on television, and overnight, 80% of the people thought he'd been in their neighborhood. Beto's doing the same thing. He is doing it, and we tried to do this in Jeb's presidential, and we couldn't get our act together, but the idea that you're a TV station and you're feeding constant, unfiltered, raw, and if it's raw, we know it's real, uh, or we perceive it's real, video content through social media. Social media is a terrific amplifier. I can destroy a 30-year career in politics by tweeting one thing right now for free. Um, don't plan to do that, not yet. <laughs> no. Got a couple of great jokes. Uh, <laughs> so the point is, yeah, bet on social media having that power. But again, it's an amplifier. It's not the cause. It's a tool. It's also democratized fundraising. It's made it a lot easier to get a huge amount of money on $25 checks. Beto O'Rourke wouldn't have raised the money he yeah, needed without, it. without social media. People would have said he can't beat Cruz in Texas. Right, because the smart political money gives to the person who's favored to win. And when you're, n when you're not favored to win, if you don't have the democratized small donor contributions or a couple of super rich people who want to run a super PAC for you, millions and millions of dollars, you have an instant disadvantage. The only other thing is you can be like Trump, a pre-aware title. You're already famous. Trump didn't really have ads. He had been on NBC primetime for 10 years in a fake boardroom pretending to fire celebrities who were paid to work for him. <laughs> but that, you know, oh, wow, he, he taught Gary Busey how to work a snow cone machine. He knows how to get stuff done. <laughs> but that perception was worth a tremendous amount in the political arena. You know, it being, being famous is very helpful now in politics because pop culture has crossed over. Got one more question I'm here. sorry, I didn't mean to go on and on. <laughs> Um, so first, thank you both of you for coming. Really appreciate it. Sure. Um, but there was a brief discussion about a potential fight between the Democratic Party in the upcoming 2020, 2020 election. Um, but I was wondering, given here in California in the gubernatorial race where you have uh, the front runner Gavin Newsom putting out an ad against the, his top Republican opponent, John Cox, essentially unifying the Republicans against <coughs> or uh, with John Cox right. so that Newsom won't have to run against a Democratic opponent like Kevin DeLeon. Uh, given that, do you think that these tactics here in California, or if you'll see them um, maybe with Republicans in other states, is that going to cause the Democratic Party to shift more towards the left or more towards the center? And, or like, how do you think that's going to shape the future of the Democratic Party or potentially the Republican Party in like other states as well? Well, we, we won't know the answer to that, to be honest, until we see 2019, as Mike said, play out in the House if it's a Democratic House and 2020 play out in the primaries. Uh, you do bring up something very interesting. One of the impacts <coughs> of the top two primary here is that if you're Gavin Newsom and you really want to run against John Cox, the Republican, and you don't want to run against uh, uh, Antonio Villaraigosa, you can make an ad and put it on saying, John Cox is a terrible, awful, conservative person who's, who's you're wrong on all the issues and he's been endorsed by Donald Trump. And you, in essence, have communicated with Republicans who like Trump and told, told them to vote for him. So you could, which, yeah. what he did. <laughs> because he was afraid that Cox didn't have any money for advertising. So the 30% <laughs> of the state that's Republican don't know who their guy is. So you put up an ad saying, boy, those Republicans, they must sure, you know, this guy's so terrible, Trump loves him, and blah, blah, blah. It was a huge gift to Cox to get him to pass Antonio. It's, it's, it's despicable, low-rent, dirty trick that Bob invented 15 years ago. <laughs> uh, I, did, I, I did actually invent it in 1992. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've got to pull the civility award here. Uh, and uh, let's just put it, we, I've, uh, we, we were You're going to see more and more of it. Oh, yeah, it's going to yeah. happen. In this system, which I think is good. We, we, we've done it too. Old number six. Uh, uh, can I say three things? Because I know we're coming to an end. 
First, it's been terrific to be here. I really like this place. I like the people. Uh, I like the folks I met. Uh, I said to Mike earlier, what a wonderful place to go to college this would be. Uh, uh, number two, it's great to be back here and to see David again. Uh, I think it was like 25 years ago that we met. Uh, and number three, for those of you who are beleaguered Republicans, uh, I believe that at some point in the next five or eight years, the party's going to rethink some things. Because the truth is, if there were a socially moderate, fiscally conservative Republican Party in California, it would be incredibly competitive. Uh, you, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger demonstrated that, but the problem is he never could have won a Republican primary. He had to do it in a recall because he was pro-choice and pro-gay rights. Uh, so I think the future of both parties is very much on the line right now. Where, where do Republicans go post-Trump, and what do Democrats do after after, and by the way, if Democrats don't take the House, which we haven't talked about, the wave of despair and recrimination in the Democratic yeah. Party will be immense. Last thoughts to you, Mike? Uh, yeah, thank you. This is a tremendous. You got a friend of mine, a movie producer in Hollywood, is an alumnus here, and he's always bragging about you guys, and it's true. I'm always very happy to come here and uh, uh, take a look. Uh, I agree with Bob about the future for the Republican Party. The Bad news is that parties are tribal, particularly now, and can do tremendous damage to themselves. The good news is they are not suicidal. They are uh, ultimately pragmatic <coughs> institutions, and they can rebound and reform rather than go extinct. So after, if we do lose the House, you're going to see an earthquake, not only as the Democrats t try to decide their identity going forward, but as the Republicans face the failure. Uh, the, the, the political failure, the rejection by the voters uh, that we have. So if you're a Republican and you love Trump, God bless you, get to work. If you're a Republican and you don't like Trump, uh, we're going to need you next year because we're, we're going to have our own civil war and we got a big thing to decide. So it's only going to get more interesting. It'll get more chaotic, but it's going to be interesting. Well, please join me in thanking our two political pros for their insights today. Thank you. Thank you.